Ladies and gentlemen, I am absolutely delighted to have this guest in the studio, and this is his latest tomb. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's called Alexandria Adieu, and it is the story of an Alexandria in Egypt in which my next guest grew up in, born in 1942. A bit of a treasure here because as we talk about events in the Middle East, we talk about it because we were born after a lot of the events that happened, but this gentleman hasn't. He was born to see the emergence of a state of Israel. He remembers the Suez Crisis in real time in 56 and by 67. He was a grown adult and remembers the Six-Day War, the 73 Yom Kippur War, by which time he was a foreign correspondent for the Independent, for the Times, for the Daily Mail. He's been around the block, he's come back, and ladies and gentlemen, it's always my absolute pleasure to welcome Adil Darwish to the studio. Thank you very much, very kind of you. Oh, it's so nice to see you, and of course, uh, you may know the name Alex Darwin as well, so if you know a pen name, have a think. This is also Adil Darwish. Adil, fantastic, and... Um, because of your very, very long-range knowledge and history in real time, a lot of people born after 73, or indeed too young to remember the 73 Yom Kippur, are drawing parallels between the sudden invasion of Israeli territory in 73 by the forces of Egypt and Syria and the sudden pogrom on October the 7th, the 50th anniversary, give or take a few days, one day, uh, that Israel suffered victim to. But that's kind of where the parallels in terms of a failure of intelligence end, because the war in 73 was existential. Golda Meir, the Prime Minister, said, if they get to Tel Aviv, you know, give me the poison pill, I don't want to live. Whereas this war against Hamas is not existential in the same way, is it? I think it's existential in ideological terms, in conceptual terms, in terms of the rest of the region. In 1973, Golda Meir, who was actually a giant uh, states person, states woman, mm. and she came victorious because what, until the PLO, um, the, led by Yasser Arafat, abandoned terrorism and, uh, and readjusted its charter for the two-state solution except Israel to exist. The current Hamas and all the countries did not actually accept Israel to mm. exist. They because just, they called it something like the Zionist entity. The they refused entity, to call it Israel. That's right, in the popular uh, culture. Mm. Mm. And therefore, had Israel defeated in the Yom Kippur War in 73. That said, as Golda Meir would have said. However, the other parallel draw, uh, it's not actually time to get involved in internal uh, Israeli politics. So I'm not a fan of Bibi Netanyahu, and I think he's not really, his, Golda Meir's shoes are too big for him. <laughs> However, Golda Meir, despite winning the war, she lost the election, mm. and I think that, that is, we have to keep an eye on that, on that political development. So the other parallel would be Hamas still an extension of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas does not... Uh, Hamas got, with the Muslim Brotherhood, a larger um, universal strategic long-term aim, which is world dominance. The Islam because they are, a, let's put it clearly, the Muslim Brotherhood are a Nazi-inspired organization, aren't they? No one inspired, it's actually documented. They're just Nazis, is that what you're saying? Well, these, the Muslim Brotherhood was founded after the fall of the Ottoman Empire right. and at the Turk declaration of the state. They came as substitute for the Khilafah, the Islamic world empire, immediately. And the first cell, international one, was formed in Jerusalem by the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hagamil Hussein. Then the second one, the third one, was in Munich in 1933, and then the picture of Al Husseini with Hitler is there, and the Muslim Brotherhood literature boasts about it. So that's actually the word of their supremacy and so on. So the, therefore, the middle term aim of Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood is destruction of Israel and ending the Jewish and non Muslim presence on what they call their holy land. So that's what I meant by the parallel here. 
that, and I was actually saying, you might not be able to defeat the ideology. You can sort of weaken Hamas uh, from a strategic mm. military point of view and tactic. But they must be not giving the perception they have won because that is very dangerous and many intellectuals in Egypt, in North Africa, in Arabia, uh, although they don't actually verbalize it uh, loudly, uh, they are wary of this perception that this kind of ideologically motivated Islamic Islamist ideology can actually win and become uh, a winning uh, kind of a slogan. Because there have been five wars between Israel and Hamas since Israel disengaged from Gaza in 2005 and each time Israel has not defeated Hamas, they've held back, they've kicked the can into the future, they've taken a view on the military successes that they'd achieved and of course the last war was in 2021 but Hamas can say and point to the fact that on the last day of that war they still fired rockets in a way that says we won even if they didn't win per se it was like a draw and so this led to the pogrom the terrible loss of 1200 civilians they can never quite be defeated in a way that an ideology can be defeated so what should Israel's diplomatic endgame be as they wrought quite a lot of destruction, particularly on the north of Gaza? Well, this is quite a problem, and that's probably why the Israeli electorate would be mindful of the failure of the whole political strategy of their coalition led by Bibi Netanyahu, mm. because there was a focus on the West Bank when the settlers were doing a lot of excesses which actually took a great deal of attention and also manpower and effort of the IDF to go and sort out the trouble there and relied so much on Hamas not going to do what they did. And I think that sort of... So the... It, it is the radicalization and if you watch the TV how the prisoners being released the first lot, most people, they're actually waving the Hamas, although the, 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 the official government there ruling the administration is Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian National Authority, yes. uh, who were actually in Gaza before Hamas took over for Israel. I remember at least making three or four visits and landing at Gaza airport which was international airport, went to visit Yasser Arafat a few times. What had, year is this? Because there's not an airport there now, is there? No, it was actually in the late 1990s, around 98, 99, okay. 2000, And what happened to Gaza airport? Uh, I don't think it's operational anymore no. now. I think it's probably used by sort of helicopter lifts and things like that right. for aid uh, coming from Beirut or coming from Egypt that used by the inter under international agreement, obviously uh, Israeli air control. Uh, will be uh, controlling it. And 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 uh, Arafat was actually having a reasonably good time. There was actually a, a, and there was a lot of money poured in. But two things happened. The corruption, that a lot of this money actually went into the pocket of some corrupt Palestinian officials, invested it somewhere in the Gulf and in Europe and in Cairo and Alexandria and so on. And the other one, the errors that actually were made, I mean, Hamas was totally unknown, was a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, until an assassination attempt on the life of Khaled Michel in the late 1990s, and King Hussein got very angry because it happened in Jordan. And as a result, the guy called Sheikh Ahmed Yassin was released from prison. He didn't go straight to Gaza. He was a spiritual leader of Hamas. He didn't go straight to Gaza. He went around Arab countries collecting huge amount, millions and millions of pounds, and then the rest is... And that's why you have to put things in context and work in diplomacy. What is it in it for partners of peace, like the Gulf nation, like Jordan, uh, like uh, the Egypt, like Morocco, which, by the way, Moroccan Jews still have dual nationalities, Israeli and Moroccan, uh, and so on. So Israel must actually get a deal with these people and with some moderate 
some Palestinians who want to live in peace, who mm -hmm. realize mm -hmm. that you have to hold an election because you cannot install an administration no. that came on the back of Israeli tanks. So the next question, Adel, which uh, we've got to ask is where are the Palestinian moderates? Because it's not Hamas, it's not even the Palestinian Authority, 88-year-old Mahmoud Abbas will not have another election. I don't think he has many democratic tendencies for one, but secondly, he knows full well that he would lose and Hamas, even after October the 7th, would win in the West Bank, which would create terrible problems security-wise for Israel from that second boundary, which leads to a Saudi, Bahraini, UAE-inspired coalition of goodwill with the United States, maybe with the Biden administration, maybe even with the incoming Trump administration, should that happen, to create a Palestinian leadership which Israel can deal with? Well, that, that again, I'm going back to history now. Please, this is why you're here. Yeah, after, after the War of Independence, which again, we just have to remind ourselves. 1948. 1948. We have to remind ourselves how this all happened. Uh, Pal Palestine, actually, geographical term was an Ottoman vilayat. Most of the influence was actually from Egypt, and there was a lot of investment by Egyptian Jews, and you could get a train with one ticket from Alexandria all the way to Jerusalem. Mm. And uh, Egyptian um, Christian cops used to go on a pilgrimage there to Bethlehem and all the right. uh, Holy Land. So that was quite all that was before. So they were. They were that was in the days before peace. There was days before peace, <laughs> and 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 then, uh, of course, there have been uh, uh, wrongdoing done to the Palestinians. There have been sort of gangs who ethnic cleansers would be law Palestinians left. But also when the war started by Egypt and her allies in 1948 to destroy the new Jewish state, there also calls on the radio for um, Arabs to leave Haifa and Tel Aviv and this area so they can uh, air raid and bombardment. Equally, there was great millions and hundreds of thousands of Jews from Egypt, from uh, North Africa and from Arab countries actually were pushed out or forced to leave. So it's quite a uh, tragedy. But all these wars, apart from 1956, there was and its complication, none started by Israel. Just put things in perspective. Yes. None started by Israel. And that's why Golda Meir going back and say that is actually an existentialist war because the declared aim since 1948 was the destruction to stop the Jews having a homeland. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because history taught in Egyptian schools after the 1952 coup, in uh, uh, Arab countries, in even Gaza schools, they do not actually mention this fact. It appears as if there was an independent state called Palestine and then another state called Israel and Israel invaded. That did not happen. They were actually all together living in one land and it was almost like a civil war but a war imposed from outside. So that's quite important history to be told. Once you understand this history, once you understand that there was Jewish refugees from Arab countries, like Palestinian refugees from the land of Palestine, then you can say, we suffered, you suffered, let's sit together, bury the hatchet, and let's look into the future. Indeed.